This talk is about the ecosystem challenges of research software. Um, what can you expect from a talk with such an inordinately lengthy subtitle? So I'm going to be um, giving an example from crystallography um, just because to have something specific to like illustrate things, but nothing of this is specific to that domain. So I encourage you actually, as I go through things, to um, see how these challenges that I describe and the um, state of the ecosystem transfers to your own domain. And um, I'll give a tiny bit of history and describe the current challenges that we find ourselves in. And then I'll describe um, a project that I've been working on together with um, Niklas Ruth from Durham, um, which is called Quantum Box. But again, you don't need any specific knowledge about crystallography or quantum physics or anything. It's just the name of the project. Everything in here is very um, well research software oriented. And so um, I'll describe um, the aims of the project because it's uh, meant to address the challenges that we find ourselves in in this community. Um, I'll describe the components that we've identified to address these challenges and with the design that we've chosen. Um, I'll give a short overview of a UI and um, also describe the architecture under the hood. And then we'll conclude and um, open for discussion and questions. Okay, so a tiny bit of um, history. Um, crystallography. The only thing you need to know about is that um, a standard technique is that people want to understand um, the structure of molecules. It could be like actual crystals, but more interesting are actually biological um, molecules. So um, vitamin B12, for example, was one of the earliest ones that Dorothy Hodgkin got the Nobel Prize for. And in the ancient past, um, the, the theory was well understood, but there was no like off the shelf instrumentation. So people just built this in their workshop. And if software existed at all, um, it was extremely custom made. Um, as time progressed, um, the, there emerged a consensus on like the techniques and the, um, the computational approaches, and then instrument manufacturers emerged, computing became a bit more accessible, even though computers were still the size of rooms and, um, software was still like mostly homemade, um, larger systems began to emerge, but it was like quite a diverse, um, and diffracted, um, ecosystem. And then, um, as computers and instruments became more off the shelf around about um, the 1970s. There was um, a piece of software called Shell XL that um, basically became the de facto standard. It was kind of the one software package to do all the um, crystallographic computations. And even today, it's like if you look at the publications, still like 90 something uh, percent of um, calculations are done with this software. So it became was adopted because it just works and it um, is kind of perfect at what it does but it has a few limitations and um, one of them is it's not open source um, it's also it has an extremely slow release cycle so the website itself says um, major releases are measured in decades instead of days so that's um, wow yeah you can wait for a while if you need a, a proper update and it also never evolved past um, something called the independent atom model. Again, you don't need to know what that is. It's just it's one of the fundamental models that I used, um, have been used for decades in um, crystallography. And it's, it's a very good one, but um, there are new approaches emerging. And the problem with that is that because this is such a, was such a, or has been such a um, software monoculture for such a long time, any developments beyond this basic model have never been able to make it into the mainstream because people just work with this software and in the couple of um, graphical user interfaces that build upon it and anything else is extremely hard to get together with this. So software interoperability is a problem, building computational pipelines is a problem. And so that's kind of the situation that we find ourselves in right now. And I bet this is extremely similar in whatever domain you're working in, even if the history is different. So let me describe the current challenges. And um, yeah, just give a summary. And these are basically, these are completely transferable to other things. So other domains. So building entire workflows where you want to take data from one program to another, like you do one computation, you want to link it to another, it's very cumbersome. And building whole pipelines, is just difficult. Um, also, if you want to do parameter explorations, again, this is true in any kind of domain. If you do um, systematic explorations of many parameters, you basically, you're on your own to 
keep track of all this. And so reproducibility becomes a challenge and data provenance. If you're trying to find a specific analysis that produced optimal results after a few months, it's hard. I mean, hopefully you've named your directories well. Um, but also if you have a, a pipeline that worked for one data set and you want to apply the same steps with the same parameters to a different data set, just transferring that uh, just doesn't work. You have to basically redo that whole, like hope either that your script um, applies to the different data set or you have to do it manually if it's a GUI. So yeah, that's challenging. Um, similar, like if you have, if you think about publishing and the academic review process, demonstrating explorations that are not published, but were like dead ends, but that you've done demonstrating those to a reviewer. Uh, I mean, you have to dig them up again and like send them over manually if you can even find them. And also testing the robustness of the results. Like if you have something surprising and want to look at different parameters, just play with them again, or the re reviewer asks you to, again, that is um, not very easy. Similarly, a lot of the software is often difficult to install. I mean, there are a few packages that um, provide installers for the major operating systems, but most of them, especially when they're written for like a specific research program um, or a, a paper publication, um, they have very specific requirements, often conflicting versions of libraries, or Python or whatever. I mean, you, you know all of these challenges. And also interoperability is a challenge because you can't just easily take the output from one program and plug it into the next one. So how do you do that transition? And finally, um, when it comes to developers of crystallographic software, they often need to reinvent the wheel because even though a lot of these packages um, have routines for common operations, you can't easily just access them. So you have to redo the same thing in your own software. And it's just a major waste of time. So we have these five challenges, A to E. And the, at this time, um, the, this is where the Quantum Box project came in. So Simon Coles and Horst Pushman are from the crystallographic community. They got funding from UKRI for um, well, actually it's two grants, but one of them is um, this basically a scientific project in need of update. And they got in touch with um, Simon Hedrick and John Robinson from uh, Southampton, from the SSI and the, um, the research software group. And um, right now we're working as two full-time RSEs in um, Paul Niklas Root from Durham and myself in Southampton. And we, well, I'll, I'll describe the aims of the project and um, then I'll show you, uh, give you an overview of what, how we've chosen the design um, to address them. So the aim is to make, it's a bold statement, but basically to make crystallography available to everyone. So rather than having a lot of custom bespoke software that's difficult to use, sort of almost like gated communities when you have your own scripts to run things, we want to provide a platform to be really accessible. Um, the Quantum Parks project tries to or wants to enable new and alternative methods. So we've talked about the independent atom model, which is the basic model that's been used for decades. But this should include new and alternative methods and um, make them accessible as well. It needs to include all existing software because the one of the things that doesn't work is just to have another software package that does things differently to all the existing ones. And now instead of like 99 problems, you have 100 problems. So this is meant to be a one level up, basically. We're not trying to do anything like to write a new piece of software, but rather we want to provide a platform that allows to incorporate all existing ones. And that's, again, it's a bold statement, but I'll show you how that um, is how that works. And then it should provide like a managed workflow and a robust computing platform to make the best practices as easy as possible, but also, um, it should enable custom workflows. And um, the question is, how do you design something that allows for all this variability? Um, it should also be possible to allow gradual adoption because you can't expect people to just switch from whatever they used to, to a new program or platform or whatever that um, takes, I mean, nobody has time to learn something new, but if there's something like if you're just like, oh, this specific part is interesting. I just want to use that. That should be possible. On the other hand, if you're like, hey, this is great. I'm all in. I want to use everything just with Quantum Box. That should also be possible. So again, how do you allow for that scale? Um, okay. So here are the 
project components. Um, these are the, the challenges that we've identified, building workflows, making things reproducible, allowing programs to be installed easily, making them interoperable, and having avoiding reinventing the wheel by having common components available. And there are basically four parts to, or four components to this project. And I'll focus on two of them in this talk, but I'll um, show them all here. So the first one is when you want to enable like a workflow and make it easy, you need a graphical user interface. Um, so this, again, helps with building workflows and making things reproducible because that's built into the UI. And we'll see an example of that in a moment. Um, but also, as I said, I mean, you can't just have, this can't be the only thing that you use because that will limit you to just that graphical user interface again. So you need a different way of also interacting with the platform if you have a need to do so. And so the back end side of things is that we um, want to provide, well, we basically containerize all the applications that we want to include in Quantum Box, which mean, and we ha have a, a loosely coupled architecture based on a message, a message broker. Again, I'll show you what that means. Um, these are, might just be buzzwords right now, but um, what this helps with is that programs, you don't need to install anything. They just run in containers and we can make them available. You can just either run them locally using Docker or they can be hosted somewhere either in the cloud or on a dep departmental server. And the containerization is also extremely important for interoperability. And I'll show how that works again a little bit later. And then the, uh, the third aspect is that there needs to be a component in this project which deals with data management and the management of settings and parameters. I won't go into much detail of this, but it's a it's a really important one. And it's obviously important for building pipelines and making things reproducible, but also for making programs, uh, allowing programs to talk to each other. Because um, if, they, if they don't speak the common language, then, well, uh, this is the problem we're in right now, right? So, we want to provide sort of like a common language for programs to speak to each other and to exchange data and um, information. And this is what this component is all about. And then the last one I'm going to be completely ignoring in this talk, um, it's called the QCBTX. It's basically a library for quantum crystallography. And, but this is the one that contains all the like common components that people would want to reuse if they're developers and want to build their own things. So this gives you a leg up if you're um, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel and start from scratch. You can start with your specific problem. But again, we'll ignore this here. I'll focus now on the graphical user interface and the architecture and the, the backend side of things. So first of all, um, this is a mock-up. Um, this doesn't exist yet, but um, Paul um, Niklas Root from Durham has done a fantastic job designing some ideas for an interface that would allow you to build a workflow and a pipeline. So um, the idea is that you, you have a, a graphical interface where on the left-hand side, you build up your pipeline. We'll see this in a moment, how more steps um, arise on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you have some sort of like info panel that gives you some information about what you're currently um, dealing with. So we start with a data set indicated by this black square. And um, we'll so you, you um, name your project. For example, you want to look at, a, at the molecule sucrose. Um, we, have a, we start with a data set um, located in this folder, and we have this number of frames present. A frame is basically just an image file that comes from an X-ray diffr diffractometer. So it's just a whole bunch of images. And the first step is you want to take all those and sort of like reduce the data and extract them into some numerical values that you can actually work with. So the way this works is that then you add a new step indicated by a triangle, which is a processing step as opposed to a data set. The processing step, um, you choose the kind of software you want to run this with. And so in this case, it's Crystalis Pro. Um, again, doesn't matter. This would be a drop down to choose the software that you want to run on this step. You can provide some parameters here. And again, I want you to have a little think at the back of your mind, like where do these parameters come from? How does the UI know um, what parameters this program provides? And I'll talk about that in the architecture part in a minute. I'll skip over 
um, the details of this, but um, as you see, you can build up a workflow like a computational pipeline here. And um, this is a UI that allows you to really put a, um, a pipeline in place and allow you to like reproduce this if you want. And um, if you think about like a pipeline and then, oops, I'm sorry, and a different data set, you can imagine like taking a computational step and um, transferring this over to a different data set. So this is a UI that allows you to build up like entire computational pipelines and do like parameter studies and so on. Um, I'll, okay, so ignore the details um, of this right now. I just want to show you, this is a, a UI, but again, we don't want to lock users into um, uh, a specific UI. So how do we, what is the architecture like? And the way this works is that everything, instead of like for the user using an application directly, so these green um, boxes here are the individual pieces of software that come with Quantum Box. Um, instead of talking directly, everything is routed through a message broker. And what this means is that um, applications can sort of register them, themselves with this central component that keeps track of everything, um, all the programs, all the software and commands that are exposed. And so anything that comes up would just say, talk to the registry and say, hey, um, I provide, um, I register myself, my name is this, and this is my version, and I expose these particular commands. And then the user can um, talk to the registry and ask, okay, which commands are available? What parameters do they expose? And um, please run something. And I'll just want to show um, like an, an example of how this works. Um, I'm gonna, this is gonna be quite quick. So all I want to take you to take away is there's a lot happening under the hood, but we want to make this as simple as possible. And I'll show this in a, um, after this quick run through. So the way this works is we have the central registry and that's the core communication hub basically of um, Quantum Box. And so if an application wants to be um, part of Quantum Box, it would register itself so it would create through this message bus, like a, a private um, queue, which is sort of like a private communication channel. Um, and then it would send a message to um, the registry and say, hey, I am this application called Nosferatu, I am this version, and here is where you can contact me directly, if you will. Quantum Box stores this information, and now this application is basically registered. It will start a little listener service that waits for incoming commands and um, then just sits there idly basically. And so now the application is registered, but we don't know which commands it provides yet. And the way this works is that um, whatever command we want to expose, the application sends again a message to the res registry and says, hey, here's a command like create TSC that I want to expose with these parameters. The registry stores this again and the application hooks up this listener service to the actual implementation. And this could be command line tool, it could be like a, a Python library routine or whatever, it doesn't really matter. What I wanted to take away from this is that this whole application is containerized. So it runs in a Docker container and um, the if a command is invoked, it, this listener is the only one that needs to know how to do that. So it's all basically decoupled. And so when a user comes in and um, says, okay, I want to um, run a certain command, it will send a message to the registry, which passes it on, and that one returns the result back. Um, okay, that's a lot. And I'm gonna be, okay, I'm gonna skip over this, but I want to, the, the point of this is that all of this is packaged up through from our project and the, the containers are provided from us. And so as a developer, you don't actually need to do anything other than containerizing your application and providing like one little script, which registers the application and registers the commands and everything else is hidden in the implementation and will the whole talking to the registry and whatever is, um, is managed for you. So further benefits of this architecture is that as a user, you only need to talk to the registry um, you don't need to know what is available. Um, it can run anywhere. And also if you want to like have parameter 
studies or have embarrassing parallel computations, the registry can just spin up a bunch of containers and run this for you, and you don't need to worry about that at all yourself. Um, okay, I'm going to do a quick, sorry, where are the slides? I'm going to do a quick conclusion, um, and then I'll open up for questions. So the two main components is we have a dedicated user interface to encourage best practices. Um, it allows you to build computational workflows. It provides recommended parameters and provides immediate feedback, for example, quality indicators that show you if your parameters are well chosen or not. Um, and containerization on the backend side is extremely important to be able to, um, together with this loosely coupled architecture that is all like message based, to um, uh, allow you to just link in any programs at any point without the front end or anything knowing like how um, what is there. It's all handled via the registry. Um, so applications can register themselves and expose their functionality. Applications can run anywhere, so be locally on your computer, in the cloud, in a hosted departmental server. And what I'd like to point out is that many parts of this design are immediately transferable to other domains. So none of this is re related to crystallography per se. And so I just wanted to present this um, so that um, to yeah show, I'm, I'm really interested in how other domains have um, tackled this kind of problem and wanted to provide this as sort of like toolbox that if others wanted to use this, um, some parts of this could be readily transferred. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop here and just open up for questions. Um, and yeah, thanks very much. Thank you, it was really interesting. Um, first question we've got is, I like the pipeline UI interface and the workflow representation. However, mm -hmm. it to be a linear flow. Did you consider iterative workflows where outputs are fed back and how that could be represented? Yes, and I actually totally skipped over the slide due to time reasons. But if you wanted to, um, so some workflows need a sort of like a, a loop interface where you run a cal calculation and then you run it again, um, and then you basically do iterative refinement. And so this is sort of like a looped interface here. Again, this is just a mock-up. We haven't implemented this yet, but there's a, um, Niklas has done a, a ton of like thinking on this and he has some really neat design ideas on on building this. And uh, yeah, so th that is intended to be possible. Right. Um, next question is, have you considered using existing workflow solutions such as Galaxy? and workflows based on common workflow language, a uh, question of whether you're reinventing the wheel at, with this? Um, that's a really good question. I I'm, must admit, I'm not familiar with Galaxy, um, and uh, I'm aware that there are, I mean, this is such a common problem that there must be tons of solutions out there. So I'm. this is part of why I wanted to present this, because I'm actually really interested in feedback from people with, um, similar experiences and uh, yeah, like solutions that they've come up with. So um, some of this is specific to um, crystallography in the sense that the, um, the way certain like commands are grouped and parameters are exposed are, um, yeah, it, it needs to be managed in a certain way. So I'm, um, I still need to do some research on which existing solutions allow that. But yeah, I'd be very grateful for any sort of like hints of if you think something might be applicable, uh, send me a message. Very, um, that would be fantastic to um, yeah, weed through the big um, set of available tools already. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we've probably got time for just one more. Um, how do you manage different versions? And can one request a given application at a given version for reproducibility? Excellent point. So again, this is where um, containerization and the whole registry concept really helps. Because um, if I go, so if you look at this, um, we definitely want to enable, uh, to, to make software available at basically all the versions that exist or that are, that are practically in use. Um, so it's just a matter of, just a matter of um, containerizing whatever specific version you have. And then as the application registers itself, it provides its version as well. And so this will be stored in the workflow. Um, yeah, when the workflow is saved, um, it will store the specific version and then will, um, for reproducing 
a certain computation will call that specific application at that version as well. So excellent point, and it's, it's definitely something that uh, we're planning to do. Great. Well, thank you once again, um, and we'll set up for our next speaker. Thank you, Matt. Thanks very much.